Okay. Okay. Welcome to another episode of Vet Talk. This is your boy, brother Vince. Before we get into our topic, I want you to please like, share, subscribe to Vet Talk on YouTube, Twitter, and Instagram for more content. And if you're a veteran and would love to share your story or resources for other veterans, please feel feel free to contact me ASAP so we can schedule a meeting and we can do that. So now that I have gotten that out the way, man, this is just me and Mr. Tom, Miss, <laughs> and we're just going to chill right now and we're just going to have some vet talk, man. It's Black History Month and we want to really just talk about it from a veteran perspective because him and I, we think alike in a lot of ways and we just want to really sit down and talk about it. So what's going on, Mr. Thomas? How are you doing today, big boss? Hey, doing good, doing good. It could be a little warmer outside. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, We went from 40 degrees to 20 today. It's supposed to be back to 40 tomorrow. So I'm ready for spring, man. <laughs> I would say, well, welcome to Texas, man, because I would say for this last week, we have had bipolar weather. Like, it was snowing this week. Um, <laughs> it went from freezing cold to now potentially is getting hotter and hotter by the second. So we've been going through this bipolar situation, man. It, I, I just call it, I call Texas weather bipolar weather. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it's been a goofy year, you know. Actually, it's been pretty mild for Southern Illinois, the weather we're having, but it just, you never know. But I, you know, man, I get a few years on you, Vince, you know, uh, and uh, I found I used to be good with the cold. And I and I think with age, it's, it's getting harder for me at times. But the other thing is, too, it's like I was talking to somebody earlier today when I was out and about. I said, you know, I can adjust to the cold and I'm good. The problem is we get cold for two days, then it jumps up to 50. Uh, so it goes up to 40s and 50s, so I get adapted to that. Then it drops back down to 20, and it's like, if it gets cold and stays cold, I can adapt, and I'm good. But when it keeps fluctuating, my body don't get a chance to adapt to it. You know what I call that? I, I, I guess that's why they call it Mother Nature, man, because it's, it's, I, I ain't trying to be sexist with it. It almost sounds like a lady. You don't know what you walking into the house to. It's like, okay, she's going to be gone today. She's going to be flipping out. I don't know. <laughs> this emotional like weather. Sound like my wife. Oh, well, but uh, <laughs> no, it's, uh, uh, it's uh, but no, nah, no, nah, thanks for having me back in the show. And for the listeners, this is not the first time Vince has put up with my old ugly butt, but uh, um, oh, no, nah, you're cool, you're cool, nah, man, you're cool. No, nah, it's just uh, I, I and I'll put it into perspective, me and Vince have talked before, and I said I mentioned to him, and I'll put, put it on this podcast on the radio, uh. I told him I would like to do the show, but to give a perspective from an outside view for Black History Month. Okay. And over the years, and for those that don't know, my time, you know, with the Army was the 80s through the 90s. And it's a mixture of uh, military time as a soldier and as a civilian contractor. And from 1982 to 2000, I spent 13 and a half years overseas in that mix of time. So just to give a... Uh, and so in nine and a half was that as a soldier and nine as a civilian contractor. So, uh, so I, you know, uh, my time varies, uh, most of it's in Korea, a little bit with desert storm and so on. So, uh, yeah, but, so. uh, always, uh, well, you know, and I, I may have been talking about black history and the perspective I give is, uh, I like to give, cause I know over the years in the army, I I've seen people, who, uh, how do we put it, have a hard time, or uh, I guess you could say racist, but, you know, I don't like using the term racist too often. That's that's a false name to give to somebody when you don't know for sure. Yeah. You know? no, and, I, I but, agree. but when people have a hard time accepting serving under blacks and that, or they bitch about it, I, I always had a, a very – fortunate experience serving with black NCOs, black officers when I was in, even through the 80s on. Uh, I've never really had any bad NCOs. In fact, I've always said I've had better black senior NCOs, senior NCOs I worked for than I did white. And that probably upset some people like I really care if I do. Yeah. But, and, uh, but I've always been fortunate on my experience and, you know, uh, 
I've always liked to iterate it. And, you know, uh, and I know you and I were talking before the show. I, you know, culture to me, it's always good for, and I raised this with my sons who are half, half Korean to start with. They were born in Korea. They raised in a house that's a mixture of American Korean. But always yes, take it, and they look very Korean. Between the part Indian and me and the Korean and her mother, they look very Korean. And I said, <laughs> you know, I, I raised them to be proud of who they are as Americans and as Koreans. And I've, as I've told other people, as I've told my black friends, you know, be proud of your culture because the culture, they are different. Yes, so sir. Take pride in your culture. You know, be Americans, but accept, you know, your background of who you are and what you grew up and always be proud of who you are. You know, in this case, being a, you know, uh, I know you and I would talk of the term. To me, I always find it more appropriate that it be black American because that's what you are. You're American. You're black. Yeah. You know, oh, and you and I would talk and I about African American. And or you could be like my buddy Harold. He goes, well, there is a big difference. Africans are a lot more blacker than I am, and my <laughs> my buddy Harold is black. I know and, we we're not quite the same, man. And and that's the reason why I'll be honest. I wish that the government or whoever started that whole African American term, because I've sat down with Africans and we've had that conversation where, like they said, I, they're more African American than I am. I'm just American. I mean, yeah. at the end of the day, I mean. Forget about, you know, slave history and all the other stuff, because even with that, that's a how would I say that's a sticky situation because most of us don't know. Not every black person that came to America was a slave. You know, there are but, blacks that came here that weren't slaves and it's hard to say. So how can we group ourselves with slave history when not every black person was a slave? Oh, and that's true. And, you know, people, you know, my case. I got, you know, if I go based off my parents, my dad's family migrated here in the late 1800s and my, you know, uh, off my adopted father, Grandpa Lucan uh, migrated to the States from Germany and, oh God, late 1880s. Uh, if I go off my mom's side, they're Dutch, which they also migrated here in the late 1800s. And I say that because I had years ago, I had a black guy look at me and goes, well, your family owned mine. I said, oh, your family was slaves in Germany? He goes, what are you talking about? I said, well, for my family to own you, your family, they would have to been slaves in Germany. <laughs> I said, my family didn't migrate here till the late 1800s. Well, after the Civil War, after the max, I can never say that word, but the, you know, 12th Amendment, the Emancipation Proclamation. Yes, you know, sir. and not that I was trying to get racial, but it's a fact, you know, when you come up and accuse me of my family on your family, it's like, well, that's kind of hard, too. I'm adopted anyway. So, you know, and half of me is Sioux Indian. So, OK, well, maybe you shouldn't came to the <laughs> state. My family wouldn't <laughs> own you that. You See, know? And that's and that's another sticky <laughs> area, because I remember being stationed in Europe and one of the things that being in Europe taught me was there were so many different groups of white folks. And to the question <laughs> I always had was, OK, which group? Because, I mean, if you're saying, OK, they were European or they were over there in those areas, I think the one thing that people don't see, those groups are even divided within themselves. So there are so many different groups of white folks and too, like, it would be hard to even pinpoint. I think that's what ended up happening is whoever's pushing that button, the envelope, or whatever, um, you know, to keep the tension or keep things the way it is, it's like they grouped everything together w without us really, really, if we want to talk about it, have, you know, and have those conversations, then we need to figure out, okay, what groups were enslaved? Because as <laughs> far as what I learned was, you know, not all of Africa was enslaved. There were only select groups that were enslaved by Africans because of, you know, tribal wars and things that still exist to this day. Um, that, you know, saying those, those groups, the groups that got defeated, they were the ones that were sold into slavery <laughs> by Africans. So, okay, what group was enslaved? You know what I'm saying? Like, it just, it's so much gray areas until it's just like one of those things to where it's just like for me as, a, as a black guy, if we, as we, as I'm going to say it, man, I, I just threw it out the window. I mean, cause to be honest, see, man, just. Part of, you know, I, I would have said part of me becoming a Christian, I had to let that part of my life go. You know what yeah. I'm saying? Because that's self-denial. Like, in order for me to deny oneself, I have to let go of the history of who I am. 
You know, that's not to say I forgot about it to the point that I st- I don't recognize certain things, but I can't use that as a get out of jail free card just because, <laughs> oh, I want to say, well, you know, I- I'm on welfare because the white man put me in a situation <laughs> where I can't make money or, you know, like I- I'll be honest, nobody ever stopped me from doing anything I want to do. If anybody ever stopped me from doing what I want to do, it was me. It was my mindset. It was, you know, partially, yeah, my upbringing because I was raised to think like a, you know, like a hood Negro. So <laughs> certain things I did was a hood Negro. You know, I had a hood Negro mindset to where when I joined the army, other people were thinking about, you know, career. I was thinking about, hey, I, I need to get money. I got to get this money. I got to get this money. So the military didn't benefit me like it would like it would have done my white brother or my Asian brother or, you know, my <laughs> other brothers who were taught how to, you know, manage. Yeah. Like it just, you know. I know. Uh, yeah, you're making me laugh. I understand totally, man. And uh, no, no, it just, uh, you know, uh, the things that, you know, as we know, the history with blacks in this country has not always been pleasant. And that's putting the terms, you Understood. know, civil rights, you know, really changed a lot of things. Unfortunately, it took to the 1960s to correct what Abraham Lincoln really started back in 1863 when uh, during the Civil War and it's the freeing of the black slaves, you know, and uh, and that's something we can't hide and shouldn't hide because as yeah. a, my as an amateur history buff, it's important to teach history and the wrongness of slavery. Because if we don't yeah. teach that, history is the old saying, and I believe that history will repeat itself. And, uh, you know, as some would say, and it's a matter of opinion as go, but like with the wokeness going on, and it's like, well, you know, let, let's hide, you know, what happened in history. You can't hide history. It's important to have no history. But, you know, involving, and I understand some of the aggression that goes along. Sometimes I think it's overboard. It's like, let's take reparations, for example. The one thing, and I take this from the Indian perspective of me, not the white, you know, screw the white guy. Let's take the (laughs) Indian perspective. I hear the reparations inside, you know, and it's like, wait a minute. Why should you be paid reparations for what happened to your great-great-grandfather? And yeah. on the further aspect from the Native American side, if anybody deserves reparations, it's Native Americans. Who yeah. got screwed the most in this country? Seriously. No. Yeah. No. Yeah. And that's but, my perspective. On, I'm just saying the reparations. And that's no, speaking no. from the Native American side. But, you know, here we're black to black history. What I like to always reiterate, because I, and, you know, I've seen it from the outside because. People don't know how to take me, you know, is this guy white? Is this guy whatever? I've been accused of being crayons. Like, do I really, you know, as I get older, I change, but I've seen other Asians and Indians, you know, change in look, especially Koreans. I've seen them when they get older. That's like, damn, he's Korean. He looks more white than he does. (laughs) (laughs) You know, and, uh, you know, and and again, you know, it's funny how what uh, genetics does with the body, you know, the body, yes, the natural genetics. You know, let me take a step back. A good friend of mine, Mike Doughty, his wife, Debbie, God bless her soul. She was a sweet gal, but she was black. And they had two kids. And you got Jeremy, you got Mike, little Mike. And little Mike is Mike Jr. He's little because he was half the size of Big Mike. <laughs> Big Mike was a very fair skin, uh, blondish, uh, curly hair uh, guy. His wife gotcha. was black, you know, typical features. And uh, now they had two kids, Michael Jr. or little Mike and Jeremy. And if the genetics, to me, they've uh, genetics will show you what it does. If you look at the two or full blood brothers, you would not know they're brothers. Because little Mike came out white as his own man, wow. blonde hair, and was an Afro. He had a blonde Afro, by the way. Yeah, and it was kind of weird saying that. But that's <laughs> his, and, and I should say, Big Mike did have curly. He had wavy blonde hair. All right. Now, Jer- and little Mike had mom's face, but was in dad's body, like, you know. Oh, wow. Now, Jeremy had dad's face. He had wavy hair. It was jet black. 
uh, he was darker than mom was. Wow. And but he had dad's face. He was like a black Mike. <laughs> he was the one to look more. He's got Mike's face, but you know. And so and but if you see the boys together, Vince, you wouldn't know they were blood bros. They were full blood bros. But that's what the genetics does. And so you never know with genetics how people look. And gotcha. that's why it's back to you accept somebody for who they are, heart and mind, and not to cover yeah. the skin. You yeah. know. But back to where we are, and we're getting sidetracked. I know we're talking about the No, no, no. I mean, everything you're saying is on top because it still goes along with black history. Um, You know, I was just talking about your perspective on it. And, I mean, it it all fits the the topic. So just keep going. Well, you know, if you take it, okay, my buddy Harold, good, close friend of mine for the listeners. A close friend of mine is Harold Mason. He's a, he's actually a veteran. We've crossed paths in the past, and we've been good friends a long time. He's a black gentleman out of the south suburbs of Chicago. And what's funny, me and, and uh, we used to do a radio show together a few years ago. But, uh, you know, Harold's got English in him, you know, uh, I think from his dad's side. And I always tease people looking at us. I said, he's the one who's got more English than I do. They'll be looking at me and looking at Harold. It's like, well, it's true. <laughs> I'm the Scottish, I think, is what it is. He's got some Scottish in it. I said, I know. I said, I can tell you this. I know this from what my mother told me. You know, I'm half I'm half Sioux Indian, and they believe my real, my blood, my mother was Indian. My blood father was uh, German. You know, past that, my adopted father was German. And uh, my dad was a great guy, and God bless his soul, my adopted father. And uh, and I'm the most like dad anyway, so, you know, I've altered kids. My mommy keeps saying, even the phys- some of the physical issues I have, she goes, I don't get it. <laughs> You're adopted, and you still the most like dad, you know. And it's like, uh, <laughs> you know, the only difference is I was the darker of the three kids, like I was telling you earlier, so, you know. I used to get so dark as a kid. People might get offended nowadays, but I used to get so dark. Mom be telling, yeah, that's my black child over there. <laughs> <laughs> it was like my buddy Harold. Yeah, I go, uh, he goes, because he's so, uh, he was so surprised at some of the foods, ethnic foods I like, especially what people call black ethnic food. I said, well, you know, my mother always said, I was, told me I was half Indian. Growing up during the civil rights era, maybe she was lying to me. I'm half black and I know it. <laughs> you know and so you know it's like you know and uh but no it just uh it, it's getting people to accept and it does bother me and me and harold a few years back we talked about we kind of made a personal back between the two of us it's to show people that we accept each other for who they are we could be friends for who we are and yes, me sir. and Harold got so many similarities. The only difference is, okay, Harold's got a little better tan than I do. You know, whoopee deal. You know, <laughs> and, uh, you know, but no, it, it, and, and that's why it's always been his goal. And it's been my personal goal to show, you know, who am I again? My wife is yeah. and I'm half Indian, half white. What does that make my family? A mess. I mean, no, it's right. <laughs> nah, but you know what? I mean, but I, I, you know, I mean, like I said, I'm not, you know, trying to bring a biblical perspective in, even though, you know, I sort of kind of have to. I mean, that's just the way God made it. And that's the thing. I think what I think, I, honestly, I'm going to be honest to you, for those who who keep trying to make a select group of people pay for what they believe, um, for who they believe th- that is responsible for it. Those are the people who really are mad at God, so to say, because if they would open up their Bible and read, they would understand the only reason why there's a difference between you and I and everybody is because God made it that way because yeah. of evil mankind. Like when you go back to the establishment of the Tower of Babel, you know, he conf- he confused the language because of, you know, mankind and the evilness in their heart. And then, you know, I was going to point out like this book right here, and you know, I recommend anybody to go get it. Um, written by Dr. Um, Bishop Earl Carter, Reverend Earl Carter, um, just going back and reading it and finding out what Isaiah 19 talked about, I realized that God was responsible for slavery because of idolatry and because of witchcraft and different things. Like he was so upset with the Egyptians until he enslaved them as a method to get them out of 
you know, false God worshiping and adultery and different things like that. So if if black folks going to hold anybody responsible, then it's okay to hold God responsible because he is responsible for slavery. Like he just is. He said that he would give them over to a cruel Lord, which, you know, in that case of, you know, the transatlantic slave, there were some cruel people who just did some cruel things, but they didn't do that with their own, I would say intellect. It was more so God allow it to happen because of just the evilness in the hearts of, the Egyptians and, you know, so, I mean, just, it just, if folks want to go back to who did it, then they have to hold God responsible and that's okay. You know what I'm saying? Cause he got a contingency plan, his son, Jesus Christ. And, well, you know, <laughs> just accept his payment that he made for your life and he, stop he, trying to, you know, charge well, God, that to somebody else's account. Well, and God's gave a free hand for humans to make the world yeah. what it is. Yeah. And, and is it God's fault that we got some idiots in the human race? <laughs> no, I won't, I won't. I won't say that. I say it's the it's the sin in their heart. But at the same time, he, you know, he, it's think it happened under his watch. You know, just like a parent, like I can't, I can't, like I was. How would I say? Even though I'm not responsible for my child' actions in my house, sort of kind of I am because if he go out there and do something because I'm his parent, they're gonna bring it back to me because of some of that. Hey, you, you the parent? He's underage. You know what happened? Where were you? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm like, okay, I was there, but that's not what I told him to do. Yeah. He did what yeah. he wanted. <laughs> well, and I agree because I know which my sons are all adults now. But when I raise my sons, I raise them to be independent because, yes, you know, sir. I'm not going to sit there and shelter my sons from the world. Okay. And mind you, my sons, being the mix they are, grew up in a – once we – let me take a step back. They, I was going to say something, but that would have been quite incorrect. My sons, and uh, which the two youngest, uh, they're five years apart. And when we left Korea in 2000, John just turned 11. Jeffrey was almost six. All right. Yes, sir. So my kids, being they weren't full-blooded Korean, endured some BS. You know, race, they endured racial stuff, and it didn't take them down or anything. It just made them tough for what they are. But they endured some racial stuff because they weren't full Korean. Of course, we get back to the States. And probably where where we live, you know, uh, again, they were one, there were a few rare Asians, you know, in this case, Korean in the area. And they had some minor setbacks with it. For the most part, in Vandalia, when we moved here, it was, we've had, it's been very good. But I raised my kids in a realistic way that, you know, they're a little different than from most of the average Americans here. Yes, and sir. to grow up on their two feet, I was I didn't try to hide them from the world as I see some do, and I got my opinion that I won't get too in depth on. But um, and uh, but I raised my kids to spec with the world because they're slightly different than the average ones. You know, my youngest son, for example, graduated high school. All right, he was one of two Asians in the class of one hundred to graduate from there. One of two. Okay. All gotcha. right, very low percentage there, considering the other 98 kids were white. <laughs> I got gotcha. you. But he was accepted for who he was, and his Korean features are distinctive. And uh, also his height, he gets his height from his Korean side. I'm 5'8", he's 6'1", and people look at me, he gets to his Korean side. Yeah, his grandfather was 6'4", <laughs> born in 19... Yeah, Koreans get Korean. tall. That's, that's, see, that's, that's a misconception that people don't know. Oh, yeah. And there's a, here, I'll give you two misconceptions on my wife's family. All right. Uh, Asian females have small breasts, small chests. Uh, okay, that's another misconception because my wife is bigger than most American females. <laughs> <laughs> so there's two misconceptions that my f wife's family is broken away from. You know, Asian female ladies have no chest. Asians are short. Well, um, not my wife's family. <laughs> they broke that misconception totally. And people, it's funny, people look at my son, and I said, he gets a height from his Korean side. You know, he's 6'1", 250, and all muscle. And uh, the BFK, by the way, big flipping Korean. <laughs> you know it's not flipping, but that he got that nickname uh, while he was working in the uh, uh, prison system when he worked corrections because the guy looked at him and a guy looked at my Chicago and goes, what are you? Because he looks small because he's so thick. Then. Yeah. And he, my son goes, well, I'm Korean. 
he goes, my God, you're the biggest flipping Korean I ever seen. <laughs> and he told me that, and I'll look at him and go, BFK. And, of course, he takes that with pride now, you know. He it was like one day we're talking, hey, damn, my buddy ate the BFK. You know, I forget what it was about, but he goes, and he goes, yeah, so-and-so's not the BFK. I'm the BFK, you know, being sinister as he is. So, and, uh, gotcha. but, uh, but no, my, I always said my son in the area, and I'm saying this, I'm kind of getting away from black history. I apologize, but it's, it's fine. Oh, no, you're fine. Actually, will lead up to some of black history. I'll get there. My son in Vandalia, Illinois, was the first minority elected as prom king in a senior year. Okay. All right. First minority. One of two Asian kids out of the whole class. That was 2013. Five years later, a young uh, black man named uh, Trevor Smalls, only black kid in a class of approximately 100 students, was not uh, was elected prom king. My okay. son set a standard there. And but yet a young black man. This is in rural Vanda, Illinois. Oh, wait a minute. Those rural white people are prejudiced. Oh, yeah, they're prejudiced enough. <laughs> they like minority, <laughs> you know. And so Jeffrey is me. Jeffrey broke a barrier that somewhere there. Mind you, this is a town, uh, you know, the kids here. And this is one thing after moving back here, really kind of. And I hear the people from the suburban areas. Well, you know, the rural people this, rural people that. Rural people are more acceptive of race than the, I think the suburban people are. Yeah. I, I, there is no doubt they are. People are accepted here. You go to the football game in the fall, I see a black child running with a bunch of white kids. They don't see each other as black and white. They see themselves as friends. I, I see you. a black kid out in the band. I see an Asian kid coaching football, my son, with another Asian kid there. How many suburban schools are going to have Asians coaching Asian kids in football? Yeah. How many suburban schools are going to do that? i am be yeah. honest, see, people don't think of an Asian in football being even in the same Same sort of set. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Well, and that's what I've said. And, you know, I got the perspective. Granted, I'm not Asian. I'm Indian. But my family's Asian. So I'm naturally kind of over cautious, over protective on that. And again, with the Indian mix, it makes them really look very Asian, <laughs> very Korean. And I'll give you an example. It's like I was talking to a parent because it was freshman. He was coach. Of, he was a lineman coach and he was a lineman. As an Asian at that, alignment, not a little running back or whatever, not one of his little dinky guys. He was alignment. <laughs> and by the way, his all conf uh his junior and senior years, he was all conference as offensive and defense alignment. This is an Asian kid doing it. Yeah, uh, and that's just soccer. Now, this year at a football game, because he was the lineman coach for varsity and he was a freshman uh football coach. I walk up, one of the parents I was talking to, who's Filipino, her husband's white, but she's very much Filipino. And actually, it's kind of funny. I walk up to the stands. I go, hey, is this the Asian section? She goes, yeah, get your butt up here. Because <laughs> she knows my son is Korean. And so we're sitting there, and she was telling me, you know, we were talking about her son. I said, I'll tell you right now, your son's got to carry the chip on the shoulder as my son does. He is looked at because he's not white, he's not black. He's looked at as being Asian, and Asians can't play football. And they, whether they realize or not, they're carrying that chip on their shoulder because now they got to play harder to prove themselves. So, but back to, you know, I and I don't want to get too far sidetracked in our... our no, uh, all, of it, all of this ties into, into a lot, because even, and I don't mean to cut you off, but a lot of stuff you're saying... Um, those are some of the things that as an African, uh, as African American, um, those are some of the things that, you know, used to go through my mind. Like I remember every time I would get around white folks, I would say because of just, um, history that was taught to me, I would always try to go around them and not be myself and prove that I would just as intelligent or I could speak like them or talk like them. So I would change the where the way I act to try to, I guess, so fit in, in a sense, but it wasn't like they were asking me to do that because most of them accepted me for who I am. 
it was just, I guess, I guess a preconceived notion that I had in my mind because of just how things always been taught in America. Like since as long as I can remember, there's always been a divide that has always just been taught to us instead of them teaching us world history. They always taught us American history from slavery, which is kind of wrong, even though I, I get it that, you know, those things need to be talked about, talked about, but it shouldn't be something that in my book, it shouldn't be something that's forced to make one side look bad and the other side look like, um, how would I say the stepchild that got taught, that got treated bad. Like we should teach it from, from just from the actual factual standpoint, like, okay, what really happened? Who really is responsible for all of this stuff? Like, you know, just actual factuals, not, you know, emotional stuff that bring up a lot of emotions. I understand that, you know, um, like Willie Lynch and Jim Crow eras, like those things, you know, make even make slavery look even worse than what it was. But in actuality, I mean, slavery was just a business that took place all over the world. You know oh, what I'm saying? It, wasn't just, it just went in America, but they don't teach it like that. Well, and even then, you know, the early days of the country, there were whites who were slaves. It was called servitude, servitude right? Yeah, I, I'm horrible with names. But they were the ones who were paid to be slaves for servants till they paid off their debt. Now, granted, they weren't left in slavery like blacks were, but they were still slavery in certain ways. You know, well, cultures have been well, doing it years. And the other question I would have is, okay, what about, you know, the blacks being enslaved by blacks? Like, what about that part of history? Because that seemed to be one that's always slept, swept under the rug. Or the fact that Indians were the last group to own slaves. Like, these are things when I read it, I'm like, okay, why are we not talking about all of this? Why does well, it have to always be towards white folks? I don't, I don't get that part of it. Well, it's true. Well, you know, some things, let's take uh, the Civil War. And they seem to try to hide the history on it. There were blacks to serve with the Confederate Army. Uh, no, and, and, and see, those are things <laughs> I remember. Because even when I went back and I read all of the Constitution, what, what blew my mind was, okay, let's just say, you know, for, for, for um, conversation's sake, they were the same group of white folks that brought blacks over here, right? Correct? That's how it was. So if they were the same group, why was one side more for it and the other side against it. Like, you know what I'm saying? Especially if they're supposed to be brothers. Like, you know what I'm saying? Some of that didn't make sense to me in the sense of it wasn't about them enslaving blacks. Like, that's what I saw from it. I saw one side saying, hey, man, this is our money. We making money from this other side. Like, hey, man, listen. Yeah, we made money from it, but hey, it's time to move on and do something else. That's the way I perceive it. That's the way I look at it. And that's what started the whole Civil War because, I mean, even when you go back to the Boston Tea Party, it was always money. Like money had something to do about it because one side saying taxation without representation, the other side saying no, y'all y'all owe us tax. Y'all gonna pay us, and it's so crazy because here it is. They were fighting about no tax, and then now look at what's happening in America now. <laughs> we back paying taxes <laughs> to somebody. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you want to hear? You want to hear me argue on that one for sure? <laughs> <laughs> like they fought against it, and now we doing it. You know, so it just. <laughs> I have my questions, man. You can't, you can't sit there and put me in front of books that ask me to read and expect me to come out with the same mindset. So when I be went back and read a lot of this stuff, I'm looking like, so this ain't even, this had nothing to do with black and white. But from the media perspective, it has a lot to do with that because racial tension, it, it, it generates money. I mean, look at what keep happening because this is the one thing that always blew my mind. As black folks, we'll, you know, go through this whole, okay, we're being treated wrong. And then our people will raise all this money from our political black leaders. But then after they raise the money and everything calmed down, nobody seems to know where the money is. Yeah, I understand that. Well, <laughs> <clears throat> let's take some of the, you know, and it's like the people who don't follow it hard enough. They hear about the Black Lives Matters, BLM, and, well, look what the blacks are doing. I'm thinking, <clears throat> excuse me. I said, have you looked at some of these bullshit riots going on, of, let's say, especially Oregon? Now? Have you seen the color of the people who are out in those riots? When 90-plus yeah. percent or, uh, uh, excuse me, 
must have been a lot of white blacks up there because I see a lot of damn whites out there. Mm-hmm. And they're using the BLM cause as a reason just to be vicious, yeah. to destroy. And a lot of these riots that went on, it wasn't, you know, granted you had some blacks in it, but most of the problems that went on these riots, they weren't blacks, it was whites. Yeah. Yeah. It was white. And it makes blacks look bad so more so than the BLM. The movement, what it was designed for, I understood, but what came out of it to me was turned wrong. But you know, even it, back up, but to go back, even what you're saying with the Black Lives Matter, the whole focal point from the founders' perspective, it was never about black folks. It was about the LBGT movement. That's what they used they used it they used the civil rights movement to really push the lbgt movement because again that's what the founders were they founded everything off of marxism so it had nothing to do with black folks and the whole it was almost like a trojan horse they were just riding that because yeah, yeah. if you go back to, to the civil rights movement cuz i used to always ask this question if black folks were being you know done wrong then how did women rights come about for the African American women when they were being oppressed just as long as the black man? Like that don't make sense to me. How how did they get on the side of oh well you know how did they and that's what tells me that it's the same Trojan horse that's always been there. Like they just find a cause or something going wrong and they ride it until you know like the Trojan horse until they get inside the doors and then now you find out what they're really fighting about. And it had nothing to do with black rights. It always had to do with LBGT rights or, you know, empowering the black woman to, you know, basically be the dominant figure in society and public. Because, I mean, it happened back then and it's happening now. Yeah, I understand what you're saying. And uh, as another subject, I won't <laughs> touch on about the L- LBGT. There's a, to me, there's a difference, and I'm going to say this on radio, and people get pissed at me. I just, they can kiss my half suit, you know what. As my 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 dying day, I'm going to tell my kids, the day when you bury me in what to be a Jeff Barrick some, uh, VA cemetery, you just put on my tombstone, my dad, uh, Tom Lucan said, kiss my half suit ass. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and put AZZ so it looks a little more appropriate, not ASF. But, mm. uh, you know, it's like the LGBT. I don't, you know, I, and we do, we got gay people in the rural area. You know, a lot of the suburbanites may not think that we do. And I got friends are, but, uh, there's also, how do I touch the subject without starting? Maybe I might piss people off. Screw it. There's a difference between gay and transgender, by the way. Yes, sir. And I can tell you right now, a lot of gay people don't like the transgender bit. Because it's like my buddy Harold said, it's he's talked to gay friends, and the transgenders are taken away from what's gay, you know. And uh, or I can repeat what a good friend of mine said, what he thought of people raising their kids to be the opposite sex. I said they need their butts beat. Uh, Dorian said they need their heads cut off. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you know, and. Uh, but, you know, that's another thing I, I could get into, you know, uh, um, you know, people talk about, I, I guess some of the things I get upset because I get a different perspective because I get a lot of black friends and yes, we sir. talk all the time. And some people get the misconception of blacks at times, you know, yes. and especially in the rural areas. That's not done harmfully. It's just you don't have a whole lot of blacks. And when they see are not a problem, but what they see and this is the big problem. What they see in the news media a lot of times make blacks look bad in areas. No. You know what I'm saying? Because no, no, I, I the news say, okay, what happened in North St. Louis today? North St. Louis is probably a black neighborhood in the St. Louis area. And it's not talked about what happened over here and there. It's, you know, because unfortunately a lot of the crime is there. And so, you know, uh, a lot of people take, oh, St. Louis is a bad area because per capita it's got some of the highest rates of crime. And it's like, no, there's just certain bad areas. But people want to say, well, all blacks are bad because of what happened in North St. Louis. 
just because what happened in North St. Louis don't mean all blacks are bad. That's a bad, yeah. that's, that's another false perspective. Yeah. You know, um, oh God, I got a friend of mine here. Give you just give a good laugh. A uh, good friend of mine lives, he's rural, lives five miles south of me. Uh, he goes, Terry's his name, Big T, we like to call him. He's 6'3". Uh, heavy set guy, about 340 pounds and black as could be. But Terry is about as country as you get. And Terry is scared to death to go in the cities. Scared. Oh. Typical rural guy. And he's black, by the way. But it's like, I remember one day we were doing old time baseball. Me and a friend of mine, Steve and Terry, we were out uh, at the game. And uh, Steve and Terry are very tight hunting buddies. And Terry, one day we're talking about, he's going up to see his sister in Chicago. He goes, well, I need to buy a new pistol. He's scared about going to, going up to the Chicago area. And more scared than I could ever be, which I don't get scared from. It don't bother me. But Terry goes, I need to buy a new pistol. Steve looks at him. He goes, why? You blend in? And I'm like, oh, Jesus, Steve. You know, of course, <laughs> you know, they're screwing each other. They're good friends. And, you know, racial humor amongst friends is going to be there. We'll just oh, yeah. with that. And you know that as well as I do, Vince. Yes, and, sir. Uh, but I'm just sitting there like, oh, my God. You know, and uh, and mind you, these two were tight, very tight. You know, uh, Steve's son, Kyle, calls Terry Uncle Terry. Terry is about as close to uncle as he get, he's got, and he calls him Uncle Terry. You know, and you're talking to white kids saying that about a black gentleman. And he is the gentleman. He's a very kind guy. But, uh, but people get the false perspective, including Terry. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and you know, it's back to it's like with the Koreans. Okay, Koreans are short. Koreans, you know, Korean an Asian women don't have chest. Oh, my family's broke that perspective. <laughs> trust me. You know, and uh, so you know, it's back to we got to learn to accept people for who they are and what they are. Yes, not sir. by the color of their skin or. Or, or how their eyes are slanted, which I got several of those in my family, a lot of slanted eyes. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, here's another one. And, 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 and again, it's the perspective people give. Well, my son was in college, his senior year, very conservative kid. You know, again, he's Korean, but he's very conservative and very redneckish, too, because he's very rural. But he, he's, he's very conservative kid. A buddy of his in school was a black, you know, a black vet, you know, black guy who was a veteran. Yes, sir. Was also very conservative as my son. And they were both taking sociology, which is a very liberal art, man, you know. And that uh, subject now. Oh, that's a very liberal art. But both, here you are, you got a black conservative kid and a Korean conservative kid. Well, one day a bunch of, and I'm going to put it the way it happened, a bunch of white kids, white suburban liberals, liberal kids, approached him and said, we don't understand how you all could be conservative because of the color of their skin. Gotcha. And my son, Lee, he just, Jeffrey being Jeffrey, knowing he's a, he could be a brute and tear somebody apart, he just made some snide remarks towards him. Well, his buddy Lloyd the black veteran I'm talking about looked at him and goes, what? Just cause I'm black, I'm supposed to be a flipping liberal <laughs> and racial. What they don't, people don't seem to understand to try to avoid politics, but what apparently the other side, I say other side being people are Democrats, not all, but what some don't seem to understand when you racial profile somebody, there's one doing jokingly. If you and I are making jokes, which some people are probably get upset, but we could say off the radio and be screwing with each other. But when you start racial profiling somebody for who they are and say, you're supposed to be this because you're Asian, you're black or whatever. No, nah, that's, and that bothers me as a parent, not that my son could take care of himself. Well, when you racial profile my son and tell him he's supposed to be some because he's Asian, yeah, or his buddy, that is that is racism to the core. I got you. And you know, and to this day, granted, it's been almost six years to happen. But as a father of a minority child who's Asian, that pissed me off. And to this day, I you know, 
I still hold a grudge on that. I guess that's why they think I'm Korean sometimes. I'm like a typical Korean. I hold a grudge forever. Oh, my youngest is horrible back. And boy, can hold a grudge forever in a day. And that's, I, I say that's the Korean side. But no, when you racial profile something, that's another. But Loy, a black veteran, and these kids look at him and say, well, you know, and tell them that, that you can't be conservative because you're black. What does that got? What does this color got to do with his politics? Yeah. And 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 that's the kind of stuff that pisses me off, you know. And uh, first of all, if these kids knew anything about veterans, most veterans are moderates and live lean to the right. Hell, I got several black friends who are more conservative than I'll ever be, you know. And one's yeah. not too far from you in Texas, an old army friend of mine, he lives in the Houston area. You talk about somebody's conservative, <laughs> it's old Kane Gratham and Kane's black. And, and Kane's one of those, give you an example, talk about the African American. We were talking about about a year or two ago, and Kane, Kane is pretty dark, but Kane is born, bred a Texan. And you know how you, people in Texas, Texans are a different breed of people. You got Texans oh, yeah. and you got Americans. Yep. And Kane looked at me, what you know, looked at me. We were talking on the phone. He goes, I'm black. I ain't no goddamn African. And that was his <laughs> reply. I'm black. I'm a black American. That's who I am. You know, and that's how Kane, you know, that's Kane. That was his answer. And I'm, I'm not, I'm just repeating what Kane said. No, Kane sound like me because I'm the same. I'm the same way. Yeah. And that's the same way Kane way. is. Or my buddy Ira, who's retired Army, retired major from the Army, actually his prior service, enlisted, made rank, got out, went OCS, went back in, became an officer. So, you know, Ira does got some, you know, issues. He became an officer. No, but uh, my buddy Ira, who lives down in Georgia, he's more conservative than I am. And we talk about it because I think Ira, Ira likes to talk to somebody who sees the thing the same way as he does, but who's a little different color. And Ira gotcha. feels the same way. And he, you know, he's told me that not too long ago we got talking. He goes, you know, he goes, just because I'm black doesn't mean I'm African. He goes, I, you know, <laughs> and, and, and it bugs Ira, you know. And so, of course, and I, I'm, I'm, I, well, you were an officer. That is a problem. <laughs> and I and I get why he said that because one of the things that people won't say um, and I know it from being in Texas, and I guess a lot of it comes from their um, interaction. But if folks never know, you never seen an African marry an African-American at all, if we want to say it like that. Because I know, like, in, where I lived at in Houston, they would date our, um, date the African-American woman. But, <laughs> like, the African-American man dating an African woman Never would happen. I mean, from what I know, I'm not saying there hasn't been instance of that, but they're they're kind of frowned upon if that were if that was to happen. They are, they would allow an African woman to marry a white man, but they won't allow them to marry uh, um a, a, a black male or African American male. That's 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 what I saw with my own eyes, and that's the thing that people won't talk about. And I and I believe a lot of things in black history is a lot of things that we don't talk about um as far as just within our own community like as much as i like that i could you know I, I know a lot has happened with other communities and us but within our own community it's, it's like that like if a black man um doesn't act like most of the people in the ghetto especially if you grew up in the ghetto we they call you white boy because i had friends that were light-skinned and we used to call him white boy because he might have dressed up like a hunter or, you know, he carried himself in a way to where he didn't like the typical African American. So they call him white boy or, you know, just I mean, it's just a lot of different stuff that went on. Even like when you go back to uh, fraternities and sororities back in the days, you know, the blacks, you know, separated, you know, amongst themselves to where they had things such as the comb test. Like if your hair wasn't straight enough <laughs> in the black community, you couldn't join certain sororities or fraternities. So it, it's just a lot of different stuff that, you know, we have, we have going on within our own community, if I, if I would say that. But, you know, I, I would always say I, I stay away from that because, again, as a Christian, I just believe it's us versus the world. So, yeah, yeah, I understand. <laughs> well, you know, you. You talk about Texas again. I had a, and see, people would, 
you know, we used to give them shit too. Mind you, this is like 1985, 86. I was at Fort Rally. And yes, we got sir. to be good friends. Mark Terry was his name. He was from Texas, black gentleman. He was an E5 NCO at the time. Mark was a cowboy boot, cowboy hat, pickup driving, Texan. And he even had the Texan draw. And, <laughs> uh, and he was proud to be from Texas. Uh, and if you had a problem being black and from Texas, you probably weren't going to get your butt whipped by Mark. And he took pride in that. And that's why I was talking with Texans are funny. You know, at the same time, I had a friend of mine who was, uh, he didn't like being called Mexican. He was, and he was unusual, speaking of, thinking Hispanics are short, you know, Mexican descent. And there's another story of Mexicans we get into anyway. But uh, Isaac Trejo was his name. Isaac was six foot four. And he was, he was, he was uh, born and bred Texas, you know, family, both sides are Mexican. And, but Isaac could tell you, I'm a Texican, you know, I'm a Texas Mexican. He called himself a Texan, <laughs> you know, and, and trust me, my friends I've had over the years, especially in the army from Texas, they remind you they're, and they were talking people of all colors. They remind you they're Texans first. Oh yeah. They're Texans. They're not black Americans. They're not Hispanic Americans, whatever, white Americans. They're Texans. <laughs> and yeah. that's how they were. I, I've had them from all sides. It's like, okay, y'all are a different breed down there in Texas, period. Oh, <laughs> they, they, they are. Trust and believe me. And I fell in suit because even though yeah. I'm not <laughs> from Texas, I became a Texan because it just, you know, it just the culture fits my personality. Yeah. Like, oh, these I are understand three people that. who just love to enjoy and do whatever it is you want, man, within <laughs> your rights. So. <laughs> <laughs> that's tech, that's the motto of Texas. <laughs> well, you know, and uh, you know, it's just a lot of black. There's a lot of black people I do know who are like you. They just want to be accepted for who they are. Yes, you know, and I've had friends sit there and tell you, you know, I'm not a damn slave, so leave me alone. Black friends mm -hmm. will say that I'm oh, not yeah. a damn slave. They just want to be oh, accepted. Yeah. And, you know, and again, I, a lot of times, a lot of my black friends I get along with, it's not, you know, uh, it's because they're veterans and we see eye to eye on everything, you know, and, and, and that's how I got to be, you know, and, uh, you know, I just accept somebody for who they are again. I, like I said, I'm, yeah. I'm not different. So my friends over the years have always been whoever. I've had black friends, white friends, uh, Hispanic friends, Asian friends, you know, which, you know, and so, uh, and, you know, our similarities, especially these days as an old shit than I am, you know, as my friends are, most of them are veteran based. And that's because oh, yeah. no. we got the same mentality. And I've always said with veterans anyway, no matter what area they serve, what branch they serve in, I can sit there and talk to another veteran. Yes, and no. we don't have to explain ourselves. Once we know we're both veterans, it's irrelevant it. what era, what branch we serve in, what color we are, because we all that, do the same it. crap. That's it. And I would say outside of the veteran community, my church was the only place that I found that I found people who thought the way I did and they were non-military. And then I would say also in my church, I would say a, a good majority of us is military. So it's like you get the best of both worlds because I would say my church was the first time I got, I felt comfortable being back around black folks. I used to say, man, I don't, I don't, I don't hang around too many Negroes or niggas as well. I, I would say, I don't hang around too many. But, you know, since I've been there, it's just like, I'm like, okay, cool. You know, what? all black people are crazy. And that's because of just my, and, that, and that's because of my experience because gr even though, yes, I did grow up around, you know, white folks slightly. I was raised in a predominantly black community. And man, when I say it was war within those community, like the scars on my face and all that stuff, like I said, that's that's from thugging as they call it. <laughs> I mean that 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 came from just in within my community. It was always, you know, territorial battles. Like if I wasn't from this section or that section, then we didn't get along. And to me, that goes back to just the the African history of tribal wars and different stuff. Cause we have that go on. And like I said, people don't want to talk about that, man. They, they don't want to talk about it. They, they, well, they just want to point fingers, but they don't want to talk about that side. Well, I think you get every community. So you get, okay. It don't matter 
what colors yeah. are. You raise in a prominent community. You take a community, let's say it's prominent white. Kids are going to get in fights. People are going to get in fights because the difference is in the mind. You know, now sometimes people will throw out a racial color because somebody's different, just to antagonize them. Yes, and, sir. you know, so, uh, and, uh, but it's just, you know, I think you see that in about any culture. I mean, come on, you know, you, you look, like, you know, if you look at so over the time, let's take the Middle East. You know, you got countries that are very similar, yet you take Iraq and Iran and, and off and on been a battle over each other. It's like, you know, of course, here we are. Let's play the dumb American game. Aren't you all Abrams? <laughs> you know? Yeah. No, no. And, and, I, and I'm be honest with you, and this is the part of the history stuff we talk about. I'm loving hearing you talk about that because this has to be, this is what people need to hear. They need to hear this because they need to see that, man. It's, it's, it's not even racism if we really want to break it down. It just... It's that sin that that Cain versus Abel, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, there you um, go. Ishmael, Isaac, like it's just that it's just that it's sin, man. It's, it, it causes you to have an inner hatred towards people for no reason because even within your own co- community, we want to call it that. You have that. You have that brother versus brother stuff. Like it just, it just, it's just a, a thing that happened. <laughs> oh, it it, it does. It's and it, it it's it's just sad that people got to quit. I, you know, before we started the show, I started telling you something, and uh, I'll, I'll, let me get back to that. Well, I came back from Korea in 2000. I, you know, I went from 1987 to 2000. I spent almost all uh, outside of 12 months. I was at Fort Irwin. I spent overseas. I was at Fort Irwin almost 16 months, but uh, four, no, 15 months. But I spent two and a half of those months. TDY the Desert Storm. That's another story how that happened. But I was TDY Desert Storm. And, uh, but I was overseas and I went, you know, quite a few years past that. When I went back to Korea in 91 and worked as a contractor. I went nine years straight. I never came back from overseas. And I, like I've told my buddy Harold uh, this a few years back, I said, when I came back from Korea in 2000, I was used to working in a community where the American civilians, which most of us are veterans, but it was mostly, you know, we're, we're there day in, day out over the years. And we didn't see ourselves as black Americans, Indian Americans, Asian. We were a real small knit community of Americans and we were mixed. Yes, yeah, blacks, whites, whatever, everything was there, Hispanic. And so we, since we were a small knit community and this was way up North outside of Camp Casey area, Camp Casey, Korea. That's Dong my Chow. area. And so we were Americans. We didn't look, we all were friends. And they, and it was a mix, you know. Uh, and so when I came back from that in 2000, like I told Harold one day, I got back to the world, back to the U.S. I, fe- I felt like I stepped back in a country 40 years prior where people are still living within their races, you know. Uh, Korean community, black community, a uh, white community, uh, even even to the degree the whites could get breaking down with their, you know, uh, where you got Polish communities and so on. And uh, you still got some Polish communities like up in Chicago. And uh, I could say something else about Polak, so probably whatever. But, uh, but I felt like I went back in time almost 40 years. And this is two, or not 40, it was 20 then, 40 now. And it's like, I felt like I, 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 I came back, I went back in time, I came back in the world. And it's like, what is wrong with you people? And I come from an area of what, you know, live amongst the Koreans. And my friends were black, white, Asian, Hispanic. And we were all American civilians that worked together, played together, you know. And so it was a, it was kind of a rude awakening. I came back to a country I kind of forgot about and forgot about how separated they came and kept themselves. And a lot of times, you know, you can point fingers at who's at fault, but everybody's at fault. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everybody's at fault. You all keep yourselves isolated in your own little, what do you want to say, racial groups. And I think that's part of the problem. Americans have yet to learn how to intermingle amongst themselves. My family does because they've had to. But, you know, and... uh, I don't know. It, it it just, and that's, it's hard to say. And it's back to people 
we got to, you know, the media's got to quit driving at the the racial issues. And I, oh, yeah. you know, because some people want to live by the media. Well, Fox said this, CNN said this, <laughs> and I say the hell with both of them. You know, oh, yeah. And, I don't know. And it just, I, I don't know. It, 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 it's aggravating to me at times. Oh, no, it is. It's a, and it ain't just me, it's all of us, but to me it does. And so that's why I've always said it's been my goal to prove to people you could be friends with somebody and it doesn't matter what color. I don't have a problem with it. I've always got along with people, others. You know, even living here in Vandalia with my youngest son, who is Mr. Let's Do Everything in Sports, you know, I'd be at events and friend of his, Leighton, who's out there, whose stepfather is black, and uh, Mark Isaiah is his name. Mark caught more hell in the community for being five foot five than he did for being black. <laughs> <laughs> he caught hell for me. But me and Mark yeah. would talk and a lot of times get along and we talk and he was a stepfather. Hey, late. Now, late, mind, he was the other Asian kid in my son's class. So, you know, probably that's why we got something to say, you know, and uh, we both got Asian sons floating around there, you know, causing <laughs> havoc. And, uh, but me and Mark has got along or it, it has a matter, you know, uh, you know, it just, and sometimes I blame the suburban areas more than the rural areas. i tell you, and to give you an example, let's go back. Oh, see my son, youngest son, I've been a sophomore year. This has been 13 years ago when he was playing Legion ball. Here we are playing American Legion baseball, right? Mm -hmm. Wow, we're coming out of rural Illinois. And on our team, we got one black kid, two Asians, and 10 or 11 white kids. And so we got a few minorities on the team. We go in by St. Louis area playing teams over there that's all white. And we're like, me and all the parents, which is a mix of parents there, were like, this is pretty sad. Here we are, a rural team. We got more minorities on our team than the city teams. What's wrong with this? And our kids, they don't see each other as Asian black. They may joke around, but you don't tease each other. But they're, they all play together. They're a team. And they don't see each other that way. They see themselves as Connor, Jeff, Layton, you know, Nick, whatever. Those are names, and I just named off four kids, three more uh, has uh, minorities, and one was white. They didn't see themselves as minorities. They saw themselves as buddies playing ball together, and they were tight, you know. And so, and there were several other kids I know on the team. I'm just throwing names right off, and you know that's what's bothered me too. Is and, and being, uh, I've kind of lived both. You know, the suburban and the, I, well, I lived on the edge of suburbia the last few years. But being living on the edge of suburbia and living rural, and it's like, what bothers me, I see all this projected towards, especially the rural areas, and it's like, the, how come the rural kids have no problem accepting each other for who they are? You know, I go to a wedding here, you know, uh, here in town. You know, okay, the best man's my son. He's Korean. The next uh, one, the groomsman, is black. That's Connor. Okay, this is rural USA. If rural USA is so bad, then how come we got rural kids having minorities mixed together in their wedding? That's that's that. I, I say it's God, man. It, it's just it's just God, man. I mean, because he or, has a way. Of <laughs> or my wife would say Buddha because she's Buddha. Excuse me. No, but now speaking of that. I, I'm not Buddhist, far from it, and I refuse to change. I'm not a very active Christian, but I am a Christian, and I will hold to that. No, and sir. I say that I've had people in my wife's Buddhist group say, well, try to get me to change. I said, no, I'm a, I was born a Christian, and, and I stay a Christian. I may not be the most active, but I am a Christian. Now, do I accept my wife being Buddhist? Yes, that's her right, and I support her in that right. Because I get a chauffeur because she can't drive Vince. And, uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, you sing Korean drivers. I'll, I'll stop there. But uh, <laughs> no, but uh, on the wheel like this. Oh, trust me. You wonder why I got no hair? I had to raise Korean sons how to drive. That, that's what my repeat of hairline started. But, uh, but no, uh, my wife's Buddhist group actually is called SGI Sogaki International. I, I'm probably international, I'm not pronouncing it. 
I take my wife to her Buddha meetings before they got silly with them, paranoid with COVID. But I take her to Buddha meetings. You go to the Buddhist meetings, and that's one thing I admire about a group. I see whites there. I see blacks there. I see his uh, Asian. I see Koreans there, Japanese there, Asian Indians. Uh, I, I, I might be missing a few there. And they're all getting along fine. They're not seeing each other as race. They're seeing each other all as Buddhist members. They talk monks. I'm there. They know I'm not Buddhist, and I talk to everybody along. But these people are not seeing themselves as being different. They're seeing themselves as Buddhists, as Buddhists, gotcha. as Buddhists. Gotcha. You know, they're seeing themselves as a member of the same group. It's like in the military. Do we have some racial issues my day in the military? Oh, you had some, but the most yeah. part, we didn't. We got along. You know, and even my friends who are black, we talk about it. You know, we talk about the 80s in the military. And it's like, you know, things weren't perfect in the 80s, but, you know, they were better. Yeah. And, you know, in the military, we joked. And again, and you know this as well as I do, because a lot of people, and even now, since you've been out, how long you've been out now? How many years? I've been out since 2013, 14 time frame. So it's, it's been a while. And wow, I 10 think years now, wow. I, I think you got the same time my son John did. So, and uh, he got out in 13. And uh, it's hard to believe it's already been that long. He turns 34 uh, here soon. Oh, God. My wow. kids are lying how old I am. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but, you know, in the Army, we always got along for the most part. We would joke. It could be things in the Army like, okay, we had a platoon sergeant do this, and, and uh, you know, the platoon just jokingly, and one day he started looking at, all right, you white boys go do this, you black boys go do that. We're all just looking at him, and he's just smiling. He's just screwing with it. You know, we're joking <laughs> around. Nowadays, they probably get all upset because he said that. That We knew what he was joking. We didn't care. We just, oh, I, I believe I believe it because my first roommate, Klotz, he, fl he flew a confederate. He had a confederate flag. In our bunk room, and at first he thought I was going to be upset with him about it. Now, I'll tell you the funniest thing about it was I didn't know what it was. I just thought <laughs> he had some cool flag, and I was like, okay, bro, bro, you cool with it. Not until I guess I started learning, you know, a little bit about it. But then, see, even there, it's a gray area with the whole Confederate thing. So, oh. I mean, it, it's just a gray area with a lot of stuff to where some things go over my head because I never personally experienced somebody being racist towards me. Um, profiling me like I've had an incident that happened where a white lady didn't want me to touch her bag and the white lady told me that she was racist and she didn't like black folks but I'm gonna be honest <laughs> I just thought the lady just didn't need help bagging her girls because she didn't do it in a way to where she made it obvious she was like no actually like I, I got it I can bag my own girls oh, okay cool and I just kept it moving because in my mind because of how I think I don't look for people to be racist towards me. So I don't, so sometimes people might've been, but I can't say that that's what it was because yeah. I wasn't looking for that. My mindset is if I can have an interaction with you, I'm going to find ways to, I guess, like make you like me because that's my personality. You get around me, we're going to laugh. We're going to talk. And if you don't want to do that, then I'm just like, okay, cool. They don't want to laugh, talk. They can go over there and I'm going to come back over here and I'll find somebody else who may want to, you know, talk to me. And that's just me. That's my personality. So certain things as just me being me, I don't look for it. I don't care. Like, even if a dude is racist towards me, I don't care. You know why? Because, again, that's you, bro. Like, you about to miss out on being around the coolest guy on earth. <laughs> yeah. You know what I'm saying? That, that's your problem. You got to go in and be upset with me because guess what? I'm going to still hang around you and I'm going to have fun. Why? Because that's just me. I'm not finna let you change me because you may not like who I am. Like I'm just gonna be me. And that's that's just me. I, I love being me. And and racism that goes on, and it happens in all races. You know that as well as I do. Yeah, it does. And you know, if you come up and if, if somebody uh would come up and say, Oh, they're Blacks are not racist. Oh, trust me. There's some out there. Oh, yeah. I've oh, seen no, them. No, my granddaddy was. I mean, let's, let me be honest. I have folks in my family who was because of whatever experience they had, but they, they ideology or the way they see things never, it, it didn't, it didn't rub off on me because again, I had a white friend named Chris. He was my best friend, same birthday. You know what I'm saying? Like, so well, hey, I, I, I like white folks. I like everybody. <laughs> 
<laughs> and uh, I was going to say something to food, but I'll hold on. But, uh, you know, it, and what happened in the past, you learn from it, but you don't yeah. carry it forward. Learn I'm from not. the mistakes of the past. You know, okay, civil rights was, you know, and, you know, let's take a step back. A lot of people, it's like me and Harold were talking a while back. I said there. You know, Harold goes, you know where people, he goes in reference to blacks, a lot of them became Democrats, is because of the civil rights movement, LBJ. And I said, yeah, and what a lot of people don't want to tell you or don't realize, Martin Luther King, who pushed the civil rights movement, was a Republican. Oh, oh my, my pastor said that in one of his messages. He, he said, he said, when did the black folks become a Democrat? Because for as long as I can remember, even going back to Abraham Lincoln, they were Republicans. <laughs> yeah, and that Harold, Harold, uh, my buddy Harold, we're both history enthusiasts also. We, like I said, we got a lot of similarities, and uh, we both, we talk about the history a lot of things, and uh, very Harry, Harold's very articulate, very open-minded, and he's like me, you know, we didn't get too far past high school and education, <laughs> but we have a life experience. <laughs> And, uh, and, uh, but, you know, Harold, that we were talking about, he, he said that he said a lot of them because of the, the civil rights movement, you know, and, uh, because, uh, and LBJ, if you would watch some, which they'll shun those tapes, I believe anymore, but if you watch the tapes, he would be upset with Martin Luther King's push to bring the equality up front to bring civil rights forward. And so, uh, maybe you know, that's well, why, maybe that's why the black folks had a, like the dude say he, he moved his ass so that they could take that shot. <laughs> and, that, and that was a black guy. I heard a black guy admit to the fact that he was a part of him getting killed because he said, I moved my head so they could take the shot. So, you know, I, I don't know. Maybe that's why. Maybe they didn't like that. They're like, nah, we don't want that party no more. Let's get rid of that. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not sure, you know, and, you know, of course, nowadays you want to get into politics a little bit. I think you're starting to see a swing back. You know, they said a lot of Hispanics are upset with the Democrat Party and are leaning towards the Republican. I'm not, I'm a moderate. I don't always take, I don't take things like some people take views based on party. I take views what I think is right. You know, now, do they lean to the Republican side? Yes. But not all my views are are based on because I'm a Republican. I base my views what I personally think is right or wrong, you know, and uh, that's how I am, you know. And, uh, you know, so uh, uh, now I've I've had the tendency the last few years to piss people off over over presidents. And, uh, you know, it's like uh, I I definitely not a Biden person. I don't like him. He's a draft dodger. Uh, he's never worked a day in his life. Uh, he's been a politician for Pete's sakes for 50 plus years. Now you take Donald Trump. Trump, I liked a lot of his policy. I, I don't like him as an individual. Just for the fact, uh, one of the things that always bugged me, and uh, uh, again, he's another draft dodger. And, and, and people go, well, you know, he would got out for medical reasons. I said, really? I said he was involved in military schools and all that till it came time to be drafted or whatever, and he managed to have phys- physical reasons get out of it. So did Biden. All right, but to me, they're all draft dodgers. You know what that sound like? That sound like some of the soldiers we went, we were in the military with. You know, when it was time to go on deployment, you find out who's a really a soldier from who's not. Cause we had people there, and you know what? I'm gonna include myself in that, but I didn't get away with it. The law was like, "Nah, you going on deployment?" And I tried to get. Out. I, I'll be honest. When they say well, y'all going to Afghanistan after I got back from Korea, I, I honestly, I'm like, man, how long go over there? And then they still, you know, I tried to go tell my command, "Oh, I got a foot injury." They're like, oh, "Okay, cool," but um, in three days you're gonna be on the bird flying out. Like what? <laughs> hey, you know, you talk about Korea. I tell you the ones I was talking to a friend of mine about this earlier. He just missed it, but he ended up going to Iraq anyway afterwards. But uh 